Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to another episode of Grasp Dog. Uh, today we are excited to have Kat Windowstat with us. So Kat wears so many hats from CMO, investor, to advisor and a mentor to many startups. And Kat is currently serving as CMO at Flores, a company leading the Gen AI revolution in Peru. And Kat has been CMO roles at multiple successful startups with collective valuation of over $1 billion. And she's also a 2X co-founders and with one successful exit. And as an investor, she has invested in over 30 startups in healthcare, AI, and B2B SaaS, including notable companies such as Anthropic, Pika, Cray, and Neuralink. It's pretty impressive. And then with deep expertise in content development, B2B marketing, and early stage startups, CAT has driven significant growth across diverse markets. And today we will dive into her journey in marketing, her approach to scaling startups, and her insights on connecting strategy to relentless execution. And thank you for joining Kat today. Thank you so much. Really excited to be here. Thank you. So first of all, you wear so many hats. You know, you were CMO at Flores and also coach at the system and also angel investor and also content contributor at Reforge. And I really wonder how do you spend your day and and how do you allocate your time? And what do you, what's your current uh, focus now these days? My current focus is my day job uh, as CMO at Flawless. And that's what I dedicate the bulk of my time to. So I, it's a normal job. <laughs> so, so that is what I'm focused on. And, and, and the company is going through a really exciting growth phase. So, so that requires quite a lot of my time. Um, in terms of coaching, that is a, um, I work for a, I'm a coach at a um, growth program called System in the UK, where they take um, early stage, um, but not super early stage uh, companies um, between sort of seed and series B and help them essentially figure out their their path to growth. And that is a um, activity that takes place several times a year, but it's not continuous. So you essentially check in with your companies several times a, a week. It's not uh, It's not too intense. In terms of how I um, spend my days. You, I try and plan my week ahead. Um, and that normally, there's always something that gets thrown out of the window, but I, I plan the most important things that I have to get allocated and, and I'm quite uh, focused about my focus time. So there's um, between nine and 12 every day, essentially it's my time for deep work when I don't take meetings and you can't, essentially can't talk to me, can't reach me. And so that's that way I make sure that my time is, is protected. Um, and I also chunk out the, the larger activities during my day. I put them in as meetings in order to protect my time and uh, give me the ability to focus. I see. Thank you. Does that answer your you, question? Uh, uh, yes, that answers yeah, the question. And oh, how about the in, uh, like investor side? Do you investor talk side. to startup often? And Yes. So, so um, there's several things that um, essentially when you're an angel investor, you you have less ability to do due diligence than a large VC fund because you have less resources, less time. Um, so the way I tend to do it is is I have some inbound from my network and people know what, what I like to invest in. But I also invest in, with several groups and syndicates. So essentially they they do um, part of the heavy lifting for you. So they only invest with top tier startups. And for that, they they um, they take a, a fee essentially. So so I invest through those um, through those syndicates. There's um, one in the in, in the Bay Area that I uh, that's how I do some investments and the, um, one in the UK called Ventures Together. Um, that's how I do another part of the investment. So they essentially come with deals and then you, you decide based on your preferences. Uh, where you allocate your money. Uh, I've done more than half of my deals by myself, um, wow. i.e. sourcing and vetting, but that is, um, that's not a scalable model, <laughs> at least not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when you're investing, so like what part or what elements do you see? So like the team or scalability, so market, so technology, so there are many elements you can see, right? So but what is the most important? Sure. Yeah. I, I think I I only invest in what I can understand. So if I can't understand it, I 
don't invest in it. That's that's number one. So if it's extremely technical um, and requires a high degree um, of of understanding in a, in an area that's maybe not familiar to me, I probably wouldn't invest in it. Um, what's most exciting to me is um, a team that solves meaningful problems and and specifically the earlier the company the more important the team is it's sort of there's a there's a very very high correlation um, between the two because if if you have an inspiring founder who's great at communicating who if you're great at communicating to me that that's the number one skill because it means you can articulate the problem you're solving effectively you can hire people effectively because they want to come on the journey and you can raise funding effectively and you can communicate to your customers effectively it's a it's a core skill almost at least as important as a technical skill um as a specific technical skill and so i look for for founding teams that uh, and for founders that that bring that um to the table and then i look for um go to market advantages because at the end of the day you can have a great idea but if you can't act, execute you you might just be stuck with a great idea and so it is how they think about the go to market and what do they have in place in order to be able to execute it so that is the second element uh, and, and that i that i look at and test and then it, it has to be big market but it doesn't have to be the biggest market because <laughs> each market is is different, right? Right now, everybody's investing in AI. In AI, it doesn't mean that every AI company is going to be um, successful just because a lot of capital is going to get pl plowed into that. So, differently to a VC investor that is looking for, um, you know, probably portfolio the 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 entire fund returns on one two th one two or three deals, I can be a little bit more flexible. So for me, on some deals, if I find it an interesting um, project, an interesting founder, I'm also um, um, happy to invest in companies that um maybe don't where well, i don't think they they will do 100x but maybe they i'm relatively sure they're going to do at 10 or 20x but overall i'm looking for deals where i think okay this has got the potential to go really big yes that's the that's yeah, the idea interesting yeah communication so point so reminds me it's like warren buffett was like you know great investors are great writers so yeah because they can articulate so what they are thinking so we are techist so yeah, it reminds me. But so how do you evaluate? So like, you know, founders or, you know, management does like communication skills or PCs are, you know, great communicator or like, so this person has a great communication skill. So do you see any like things? So when you are like communicating or meeting founders? The the first, the, the first hurdle is, is the pitch. When you hear a great pitch, you just know it because they are able to take complex information and um, distill it in a way that is incredibly exciting. You get the sort of FOMO feeling. Um, yeah. um, and the simpler they can make it, but not any simpler, is, 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 is a sign of a great founder. The tendency very often is to try and pack everything in and show everything off but really you have to distill it down to the basics and and for an investor you have to anticipate what they're going to say next so each slide has to be sort of um hitting every point that you as an investor are already thinking about so so that you stay with them throughout that story so i think you can get quite a lot from that um from the pitch and then and then when you have the chance to interview them afterwards or when you see their founder interviews excuse me Sometimes it's it's a case of, um, for example, in in Anthropic, I invested because um, there was a secondary share sale um, at a very good rate. I didn't interview the founders. I mm. I just knew Anthropic is a very very powerful company, building a very very powerful technology, and I had a good opportunity to get in on the deal, so I did. Nice. And at the same time, you are really well experienced CMO, right? Marketing growth person. And do you help startups for their marketing or strategy, like thinking about strategy sometimes? Or is it hands-off usually? Um, no, I'm very hands-on. So I oh, I um, do the doing, basically. So I come up with a strategy oh. that feeds off the overall business strategy and then figure out what is the role of marketing to help achieve the overall business goals, be it get new customers, more brand awareness, revenue. And so I, I devise plans that align to the business strategy and then 
execute them. I build the systems, I hire the people. I uh, sometimes, you know, recently I've been writing all of our content. Like there's, I'm very hands-on where, uh, where it needs to be. And, and, and it's a bit like, yeah, being in founder mode <laughs> sometimes when you're at an early, early stage company, because you have to do bits of everything. So, so, so I'm very hands-on. Yeah. Wow. And at the same time, I'm curious, you know, because you are currently serving as C CMO at Flores, right? So meaning right. you invest in some company, but you help some companies. You know, do you have criteria? Oh, I want to join this company. Oh, I am okay with investing in this company. Do you? I mean, the the of, of course I have criteria. What I find the most interesting when I think about joining a company, I have to be excited about the problem. So in Flawless's case, what they do is they um, take content films um, <clears throat> in foreign languages. So let's say a Japanese film, um, and they translate that through the software and out comes the same film with the same actors in English or Croatian or um, Swedish. Uh, so we can translate to over 40 languages. To me, that is incredibly exciting. And, and the mouse movements are absolutely perfect. You can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly it unlocks content at a global scale. And it's interesting to me to be part of how a company like that is being built. Um, that's the that's the first thing. And and secondly, the the company's at a very, very exciting stage. So there there was some marketing in place, but it hadn't been built for scale yet. So I was able to come in and help set the strategy and help build the systems in order to um then execute faster in a, in a in a in a more focused way and so so that to me is a very very exciting time and so when i when i join companies i try and come at a time where i know that my skill set will be most valuable so if i'm the first person let's say there's a founder team and and they're looking to hire the first marketeer that's a little bit less exciting to me because you're still going through so much iteration on who's your customer what you should, what's your positioning what's your like you have to design everything from scratch. I prefer, um, I've done that, but I prefer to to come in a little bit later um, when you can sort of bring that knowledge and and, and scale it. I see. And I, I still remember the first time I saw the Flores video and changing from Japan, English to, I remember Japanese or Japanese, speak Spanish yeah. and then and then, then speak like the mouse move changed and that was really impressive and so, yeah, so surprising. And then yeah. in that sense, you know, as a marketer or a marketing person, if the technology is really great, is it easier for you to like uh, spread the product or do your marketing job? Or it doesn't matter. Very good question. Job. It's definitely easier to spread it to a generalist audience. I don't know when mm -hmm. you saw that video, right? But maybe you saw it a long time because before you discovered me because it it, it went viral, right? That 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 language change video. So to me, it was exciting because everybody can understand that problem um, of how to translate films in a better way. And the technology is, is, is really great. What, um, but it doesn't mean that more niche problems are less interesting, but there are different ways to get your message across to different audiences. So I just spoke to somebody who has a medical device that helps detect skin care and they need to, their audience is less the general public. It's more um, key opinion leaders, medics uh, um, and practitioners in specific hospitals. So it's a different challenge. How do you get to them? What message resonates with them? So you just, I think you just have to, the product has to work and has to be good and has to be solving a valuable problem. But then you just have to figure out the way to get to your target audience in the best way. So in a nutshell, I can get excited about many things. Um, <laughs> but um, when the product is as great as Flawless is, it's, it's easier. I see. Thanks. Yeah. So you mentioned that so you want to join a company as a CMO later phase. But so, yeah, want to know more about like, you know, startup like marketing. So like... As a founder, or like you know, as a fast like marketer, so what kind of skills or experience do you need for like a you know, fast marketer in a startup company? 
I think you have to be um, what they call sort of T-shaped. I think the first, it depends on what the first problem to solve is. But most of the time, when you are the first, the brand and positioning in the market often isn't clear. So that's often where it starts. And in order to get that clear, you have to start with a customer. So you, you have to know how to understand the customer and the market. That's number one, because otherwise you can't market to them. So, so you have to find, um, be able to find customers to interview them, understand where they are, understand um, their jobs to be done, like what are the outcomes that these that the prospective customers are looking for and then how you can help build a solution and market a solution that's relevant so that's i think the first skill is it's almost being like being a journalist and then the second skill you have to be able to think like a business person you, you, you have to find the shortest way the most efficient way to get to that customer to tell them what they want to hear um not what you want to tell them but what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, because if you tell them what you want, it has to be relevant to them. Yeah. They, they don't really care about you, right? And you have to make it relevant. So, so the second skill is that you have to have, you have to understand business metrics and you have to understand the role of marketing in, 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 in delivering customers and revenue to a business. Um, so you have to be business minded. Um, and then, depending on what your market is and what you're um, selling to um, the prospective customers, you have to understand, you have to be able to think in systems and how to build systems so you can make it repeatable so that not every process you have to start from the beginning, but you can make it scalable and repeatable and automated. And then lastly, you have to know tools. So it can, and tools can range from frameworks on how to think about problems right through to, um, marketing automation tools nice see. and so so maybe this is a dumb question maybe but you know i i, I have seen many startups like you know like uh, especially early stage startup that you know the marketers try to create a like a brand marketing like uh, based on what they have now what they want as we mentioned what they, their customers want to hear right but sometimes founders is visionary so they say oh we are kind of how to say if they are bookstore they should say bookstore right but there's a founder sometimes too visionary so oh we are collective knowledge everything store whatever so that's, that doesn't make sense but for them it's like oh it's a future we want to go so that's the branding we want to send to people send out to people the board but you know from customer wise or what's this company to them they don't understand so have you seen this miscommunication mismatch and i i sometimes see this and then you know and how would you this is a very good point actually you pick up there's there's a um a, a lady that i follow you should get her on the podcast she's amazing she's called april dunford and she is the world's expert in in positioning and she actually talks about this this problem so the founders they have a vision and the vision is the everything store 10 years in, in advance. I watched a video today about the Sheikh of Dubai who drove through Dubai in the 60s. There was nothing. And he was talking about what D Dubai was going to be. And you think like, it's, it's completely crazy when you just have a desert, right? And so it's the same, <clears throat> it's the same thing. So you, you have to know what you say to whom. So to investors, you want to sell a big vision. We're going to build the everything store and it's going to change um, 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 how people buy everything and we're going to focus it on one thing which never changes which is people want better products faster and cheaper that's the principle that i'm going to build my company on and then you work backwards and you go okay what's the easiest thing i can start with okay i'm going to start with a bookstore and then i'm going to add in i don't know what a second product was that he added but gardening tools or pet food or i don't know and then you build it up from there that's what you tell investors and maybe employees but your first customers, you have to tell what you're able to do today and maybe a little bit ahead of that. Um, we're, we are the world's best bookstore. We have all the books um, in the world and you can get, get them tomorrow because that's what's going to sell. They're not going to care about the everything store because that doesn't mean anything. So so there's, there's two different messages for different audiences. And what you have to figure out is from the vision, what is the strategy to get there? You work backwards and then you talk about the thing that people can already 
see and relate to and make that important to them. I see. And I remember I watched a video and you show, you know, like each executive's roles and the CEO has a, has a KPI and each CXO has a KPI and in each year, what kind of goals, you know, each like uh, executive should hit you know, something like that. Do you recommend that way to track the, the goals backwards to achieve, to, to get to everything store? Um, I, in terms of getting to the vision, I think you have to be flexible on how to get there because in each year you, you need to achieve different things. But I, I do really believe in sort of, and you know, you need to be specific, need to be extremely spe specific about the next six months, possibly a year. At the moment, like things change so fast. So for example, in companies I've worked in recently, we don't plan for a whole year because it, it's it's too far out. Um, we plan in, in <clears throat> loosely for six months and then very tightly for three months. And that's kind of more work, but you get higher accuracy. Um, in my view, you should have your vision and then you work backwards. It should be sort of in 10 years, we're the everything store. In five years, um, we cover most major categories. In three years, um, we we dominate books and a second category. Therefore, this year, we do this in December, this in November, this in October, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it does make sense to have that clarity in your mind that you, you then need to translate into KPIs that mean that you are on the way to achieving that. So that might mean number of um, partnership deals in place. That might mean um, VC funding secured. That might mean higher ahead of logistics. Um, and so you have to translate the vision into meaningful things that happen every year. And what each CXO does, in my opinion, absolutely has to ladder up to what the CEO delivers. So. I can give you a specific example. In a previous company I worked in, the CEO had to deliver revenue. He had to deliver EBITDA. He had to deliver patient um, NP, a net promoter score and I think cash flow. Marketing's role in delivering revenue was very clear because we were the only revenue driving channel. Um, but operations had a clear role because they could roll and, and together with product could roll out new products. So they had a link to revenue. Um, uh, in this case, uh, net promoter score and quality sat under operations because it was a clinic chain. So they had a very clear direction to that. Um, um, and so you, you have to break down what each CXO can do in a meaningful way that ladders up to what the CEO has to deliver and if that is well done all the ceo has to do is raise money and hire people i see is that about the doctor consulta you, you work? exactly yes you got oh, it okay. <laughs> and sometimes but sometimes i see especially communication between marketing team and a product team kind of how's the conflict sometimes because product team want to increase conversion rate and but marketing team Sometimes want to increase more, how to say, acquisition, user acquisition. But the product team, oh, don't, don't bring, you know, the, only bring right, right users. Otherwise, conversion will get low. And so have you seen this, like, issue, conflict? And do you have advice for this situation? I, I mean, of course, CEO should have, you know, clear goals, but something internally, internal conflict. I think it's quite good to have those levels of tension sometimes because I think it's healthy um, because it makes me, if my job is to bring leads, it makes me focus on driving better leads, right? And maybe I should have a conversion goal also, right? Maybe maybe I should share that with a product team. Maybe the product team should share traffic because um, if the website is, is, is bad, you don't get any uh, repeat users, right? So you can share uh, uh, KPIs. I think... Um, I think healthy healthy tension, I would call it a is a is a good thing. It definitely happens. I've I've seen it in particular um between um yeah, most often it happens between product and marketing. I have to say I'm very lucky right now because that's not the case, <laughs> but I've definitely had the experience before. I see. Yeah, and when making like North Star goals, so I think this is difficult to make it like so usually how long does it take? to like make a North Star goal. And so if there are any like common mistakes or pitfalls that like startup, so 
you know, you know, long doing long way. I think, I think uh, what I would say the mistake is thinking about a North Star goal without mapping out what your customer journey is, because you, you have to, and, and, and your, what your, excuse me, what your growth model is. You have to understand how your company grows and you have to draw it on one page. Like what are the things that are going to go in at the top SEO events, um, LinkedIn, whatever, where does it go to? Um, does it go to a, a trial? Does it go to a landing page? What happens there? If somebody signs up to the trial in a case of a SaaS company, what do we want them to do? Do you, you know, do they, is it revenue or is it a number of, um, I don't know, uh, engaged minutes or um, active users per day or a number of songs played? If you're, if you're Spotify, what is the thing? What is the quickest indicator that shows you that you're adding value to someone? Mm -hmm. That I would think about it like that. So you, you, you draw it. And then, and then you go backwards from there. And, and perhaps for Spotify, if you think about it, minutes listened per day could be the, the number one indicator to show that their product is adding value. And therefore, if their product is adding value, they can charge for it. And people are not going to, um, people are going to pay for the product because they don't want to have the ads. And they're going to tell others about it. So you get word of mouth. And um, they're going to convert easier through the website. So, so think about what the number it's it's often something more nuanced than revenue because revenue is just a consequence yeah is that helpful i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it makes sense yeah but we need to dig into metrics analytics and so yeah map out what is like causing this program this you know kpi yeah like yes at, at, at the same time, you know, things don't go as we expected in startups, right? So let's say you yeah. set the ideal customers and, and some goals, but let's say you wanted to set a book, you know, because we were talking about books or in bookstore, but realize, oh, people are coming to our website for pet pet food or something. So in, in that, then it's grown. So this happens sometimes, right? In, in, that, in that sense, you know, would you recommend people to that idea or how, as in a, I tell you why, I tell you why, because the number one job of a startup is to not die. Mm. So if you keep on, if you keep on selling books when people want pet food and you run out of money, you're dead. So it's better <laughs> to go and pivot it to that, pivot it to pet food. And you can come back, you can come back around. I, I've had this experience where in a startup, it was really um, focused on selling a clinical product, a clinical diagnostic product. Um, it was an online mental health evaluation tool. And they realized that that's what they wanted because they wanted this product in doctor's hands. That's the most important way. It's going to make a difference to the patient's lives. However, they realized the tool could work as an indicator of mental health problems before they emerge in large scale um, Populations like truck drivers, um, um, flight attendants, uh, docs, people who, who um, are tired often and exhausted. There's a simple test you can perform through the tool, which then says whether you are, it's a sort of almost mini triage. And there was a lot of tension in the company at the time because they didn't want to go down the wellness route because they wanted to be a medical product. And um, I argued for the... Um, for going down where the customers were because they were willing to pay. And so if you have money, you can then develop the clinical studies and that product. Uh, um, and and yeah, you, you can't ignore the customer essentially. And you can come back around to, to, to the original vision over time. It doesn't really matter how you get to your North Star um, or to your long-term vision. But me personally, I would pivot. <laughs> I see. In that case, in, in that case, you know, the startup should change North Star to adjust to the market for now. Yes. And, yes. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. I think so because you, you you don't know what you're going to get from the market, and you don't know what they, what essentially is going to is going to um resonate. I can't remember the name of the startup now, um, but they they were selling, um, different uh, um 
tools for designers. And it turns out that, that there was one product feature that kept being used, which was sort of to make your own postcards that you could then um, um, print and send to your friends. And, and they just kept getting so much traction on this particular feature. And they actually just pivoted the company to do that because that the money was there. And then over time, they added on and started focusing on the other features. But the number one driver was that one thing they discovered when they looked at the data, that that was where um, they could gain traction. See, oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. I was curious about it, about that part. But, but also, you know, uh, I'm curious, you know, and this is a little bit different topic, but, you know, nowadays, you know, AI is dominant and people use ChatGPT, adapting ChatGPT, Anthropic Cloud, and Gemini, Google Gemini, and so on. Has that, has, and, and also it's, people use it for their work, right? Has AI development, advancement, change how marketing team work? Or I'm curious about oh the impact of AI. Like, I was in a marketing function a year and a half ago, and I just started using a bit of ChatGPT. I mean, I literally can't do my job now without it. Impossible. Um, absolutely impossible. The entire, the workflows, the information summary, content writing, um, video editing, analytics, it's, 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 it's changed everything. It's changed everything. And how do you use it? Like, uh, I'm curious the, the specific use case or examples, if you can share. Sure. Um, so I use it um, for everything. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so I did custom interviews last week. So I um, recorded them, like I would have recorded this interview. Um, I got the transcript. I, um, um, so, so, so I, um, some, I only had video, the transcript didn't work. So I, I used AI to, um, um, turn it into, um, a script and then give me a summary. Um, but not only give me a summary, but give me a summary and a jobs to be done, um, framework. I, I got, I did that to then put it into an Excel spreadsheet, tease out the main insights, um, and um, the sort of next steps. I then still had to read it, of course, but but it basically summarized five hours of interviews for me um, into a useful framework. Um, um, we have a custom GPTs to uh, write content in the different voices of different people, um, which again, all needs to be checked by a human, but um, we use it for spell checking. Um, um, we use tools like OpenAI, not OpenAI, um, Opus Clip, excuse me, um, to cut down video content and add um, voice, uh, not voiceover, uh, to add um, subtitles on it. Um, um, God, what else? So, so a lot of it is around content creation, essentially. Uh, Canva, we use the AI function on Canva. Um, I use the AI function on, on research. I, I use um, um, any market research, reading of large documents, summarizing, um, organizing information. That's probably my main use cases. I've used um, I've used it also for Excel. So I just talk to it and say, put this please into um, rows and columns and um, write these formulas and explain this formula. Or, like I've used just a voice interface to go like, what is the sort of if error function again? <laughs> and um, what have I done wrong? Why is it not working? Make it work. Um, so it's done pivot tables for me. I mean, it's quite remarkable well i see yeah and i'm i'm not a power mm -hmm. user i'm i'm sort of i feel like mm -hmm. i'm a complete beginner when it comes to it i'm sure there's a much much better but yeah uh, but yeah. is that is that a is that a jobs previously someone's doing right i think is that a junior yeah, yeah. i mean like people I, or whose job is that depressed ai is replacing please it's a contents person I mean, I don't think AI is good enough to replace a content person. It has just changed how a content person works because you can tell when content is made by an AI, even if you train it on your own voice. It's it just always cranks out the same format, right? Hey, um, um, interesting news. 
this, here's what I learned. One, two, three. You know, mm-hmm. um, you can just see this tick, tick, tick with it, with all the emoticons and then all the hashtag. What do you think? You know, it's 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 always the same format. So, so you don't want to sound like that. So, so somebody who's in charge of content um, can take that and make it better, make it more human. But where it's um, invaluable is building like we've built an automation so it goes and scrapes content from the internet um from um, from feedly um helps us divide it into topics and into content pillars and then generate content ideas if you're in a rush for example or summarizing large, large parts so it hasn't really replaced the job and i think it's just made the job of the content marketer more important because they have to add the human element I give you an example. I, I worked with a copywriter the other day and he had a really great, so he writes great copy, right? And so, and you should think he could be getting replaced, right? Because an AI can just write a blog post. But his tagline is, um, which he ha- had on his LinkedIn, and I thought it was brilliant, was wordy words and thoughty thoughts. And so as a copywriter, it's kind of funny. It made me laugh. It showed me his personality and he he has to think thoughty thoughts to write wordy words um and ai can't do that it can't have that sensibility the sense of humor um so not yet <laughs> <laughs> i see but I, I like your tagline so on your website so it's saying like working with the world's best companies before they are the world's best companies yeah, I like it. Thank you. So it's not AI made, right? So no, uh, it was made by that. <laughs> oh yeah, time. thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> He's very good. I can give you his name. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, just curious, like you know, do you have any companies so you've been watching so in terms of marketing? So like you know, for example, maybe like many companies like list up Nike as a great marketing company, but do you have any companies you've been keep keeping watching or get inspired? Or the opposite, you know, oh, we shouldn't follow this company. <laughs> Politics or something. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, the, the first thing that just came to my mind just now was IKEA. Ikea. I think they've got really good marketing. Like, they've always got the Swedish, mm-hmm. you know, they had a radio ad this morning, I heard, and it was, you know, it was a Swede, talking Swedish, and they, they made something out of the meatballs. You know, people go to Ikea now just have meatballs. That's kind of a crazy thing, right? They mm. love eating Swedish meatballs. Um, mm. It's yeah. it's really s- solid. And, and I kind of always see it. Um, uh, who else has got good? I, marketing that sort of... As long as it's... If it's humorous and slightly controversial, I love it. So the, the the other thing that comes to my mind is a really old one, but I think it's brilliant. It was um an old Avis ad, and they said it just said, when you're number two, you always try harder because Hertz was the first car rental company, you know. So yeah. I think IKEA comes to my mind. Um can't think of anyone else right now. Mm. I mean, Donald Trump, he's a love him or hate him, but he's got a pretty good, um, he, he is yeah, unbelievable, yeah, probably, yeah. unbelievable how he is able to navigate. He's like Teflon. He's everywhere. Um, nothing seems to be able to stop him. And, and that is quite remarkable in terms of the... Uh, it's quite shocking also <laughs> but, yeah. but that's yeah. something seems somebody is doing something right for him right mm-hmm. yeah. um yeah so my, what i'm interested my, my in favorite... is personality branding like how like how founders are being used to do marketing so mark zuckerberg i've seen more about mark zuckerberg than about meta mm. for example yes. sorry you were saying something oh no yeah my favorite marketing banner is like uh I forgot which company, but you know, like they paint using Windows Paint, and then oh, we need oh. design. <laughs> that's what I'm oh, that's great! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great out of time. It's usually yeah. st- stuff that's really simple, right? 
Like mm -hmm. I, I quite like the HSBC that, you know, when you fly away, they always have the, the jet in London. They have the, the jetways, you know, that lead to the airplane. Mm -hmm. And they always used to have, and now it's a bit um, less funny, but they always used to have, ask you interesting questions as you were walking to the plane. And you always like reflect on something. It was always a message about sort of connecting the world. And it was, I don't know, it just, I always saw that. Or obviously I still see, see that. Um, and I, I love it when companies, they, they, when they make fun of other companies, basically. I saw EasyJet making fun of Ryanair, which had two airlines here. I think that's always quite funny. Yes. Uh, and so like uh, in the early stage startup, so like what channel? So yeah, of course it depends on the company's or product service, but so what channels? So do you recommend to use as a marketing channel? Like for example, SEO, Twitter, social media, so YouTube, so or like offline, so marketing, so there are many marketing mix, right? Well, there's a lot. Yeah, it's it's you can't really generalize. I think you 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 have to figure out where you can get the most distribution, um, in the quickest way. So we did something in a, in Doctor Consulta, Brazilian healthcare company, very counterintuitive. We had clinics, and you would think, okay, basically posting on social media and getting PR would be the best way to grow but you know that you can only improve your channels and you can only spend so much money like even if i bid for all the keywords like i'm still not gonna uh, um, get that much more traffic right there's a limit um yeah. so so we actually went to outdoor media so we just plastered the entire town yeah. uh, in relevant locations um with all the media bus shelters buses um the underground television in the underground, the seats in the underground. I mean, you couldn't get away from it. And mm -hmm. that was quite cheap actually, because um, really? people, um, it was uh, um, really impactful. And and the advertising in, in, this was in Brazil, wasn't, yeah, we got a good deal on those channels and, and mm -hmm. massive awareness. Um, but for example, for Flawless, wouldn't really make sense, right? For this company I work for now, digital company, I wouldn't, out of home makes no sense for them so there here it's much more about showing the output of what you're doing and showing how your you know like runway is doing or like mid journey they're showing the output of their technology so that's you have to be on digital channels in this case i think pr is the number one if you need need one if i have to reduce it to one pr is the most effective okay i see sorry uh, this is a little bit off topic but you know i was always wondering you know from your linkedin and your profile career and i always wonder like have you thought about becoming ceo because it seems like you are co-founder you have done marketing job and also gross chief growth officer gross officer and co-founder ceo but have you thought about becoming ceo in your career um, i've thought about it but um um i don't want to <laughs> I don't want to do oh. that job because uh, um, I think it's very lonely. Mm -hmm. I think it's very lonely because yeah. you have nowhere to hide um, and everything hangs on your performance. The buck always stops with you. And, and I'm a mother. I have three young children and it's being a CMO is quite difficult, but a CEO is is another level of difficult and another level of responsibility. Because you, at the end, you're responsible for all the people, all their jobs, their livelihoods. It's, it's you. I see. Yeah. So maybe later. And, and yeah, maybe maybe later. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the future. At the same time, you know, nowadays, you know, like a the, the new concept, like a fractional fractional CXO, the new concept, you know, came up and, and people, you know, some company adopted and but I've never had a fractional CEO, but you know, what what's your thoughts on fractional uh, like position or, or role? I think especially for marketing, it's a really great thing because um, CMOs have the lowest average tenure of any CX role. So, um, mm. CMOs last usually 18 months, whereas a chief operations officer or a CFO or chief people officer, they last longer. Um, oh, why? Do you know why? Yeah. I know why. Uh, well, I have my theory why this is. Because as a marketeer, you interpret 
part of your job is interpreting the founder's vision to the audience and that is a uh, is difficult for a founder who has a vision because it's their baby it's their idea their their everything and so you have to take that idea very carefully and deliver it to somewhere plus you can't measure everything in marketing and and you can measure a lot of things but you can't always get to a clear why and and sometimes things take longer and the patient runs out or sometimes you have tried a wrong channel because you have to try things to see whether they, they work and and it's very easy for marketing to be the first on the chopping block because it seems like the function that most people have an opinion about whereas if you're the CTO, it's harder to know the code and how good is the code, right? Whereas, ah, I didn't like the advertising campaign. It's easier, right? Everybody can have an opinion. And so, so I think that's part of the reason. So what do I think about um, the fraction? I think having the right person in place is, is a really good thing because they come in, they have done this before. They're just repeating a set of, um, they have a particular approach and they come in they solve a particular problem and then leave, leave again, ready for the next person. And so very often when you go through a companies go through stages and, and when, you know, it's highly unusual that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is still, for example, the CMO of CEO of um, Meta. And, and very often there's a certain life cycle to a C, CXO because different skills are required at different stages. So when flawless where I work now, when that's a multi-billion company, maybe there's a different profile needed, um, four different roles in the companies, it's quite normal, right? Um, and so the concept of fractional reduces the risk on both sides. Um, so they come in, do the job and then and then leave, which is still 18 months, 12, you know, 12 months. It's a it's a it's a relatively long time, but um you get expert help without having a downside risk on needing to get rid of an employee when it doesn't work out. And the associated cost with that. I see. So, so in that sense, I, I was curious, you know, having fractional CXO and versus like freelancers or contractors, but do the CXO job, is that same or different? Or I'm curious about I think what's it's the best. Just way? a mindset question. It's probably contractually the same thing, right? They're freelancers or consultants. It's the same. But I think if you say you're a fractional CMO, you're committed. You're committed to a phase, whereas a and you're committed to a project. If you're a freelancer, I think it's a bit more in, non-committal. I mean, you could also say, "Oh, I, I, you know, you're an employee that leaves every eighteen months." It's it's kind of the same as a fractional person, if you will, but it's different because your mindset is different about it. So I think it's uh that's how I would answer it. It's the same, but you think people think about it in a different way. <laughs> also, this is kind of stupid question, but so when when you are hiring marketers, so and so what what kind of skills or experience what things so do you see so in the candidate? For example, so there's like a marketing interview. So for example, there's a like, you know, how to say? So scenario, so this company X is want to it, it want to like increase the for conversion rate. So so if you are a marketer at this company, how would you do? So or like you know, you just want to like interview marketers, marketing can, candidates, and see their like background experience skills. So what is a like typical marketing like interview flow and what elements so do you see in candidates? Oh, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, this is a tough question, sorry. But, tough yeah, question. But, yeah. I think the, the first thing you have to get a sense of the culture fit, you know, because ah, yeah. like, are they nice people? Like, or are they, you know, Beating is there some company. element yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, when you, you know, you want to know whether someone's a high performer, but you also want to know, are they nice? You don't want any sort of backstabbers or assholes basically like an, an asshole can like destroy the whole <laughs> the whole team right so you got to filter for for that for the for the no assholes um and then i'm interested in people's experience but i'm 
more interested in their ability to learn and think through problems. And especially like I did a post about this this week about hustle. Like you got to hustle when you work for a startup. You got to figure out problems. You got to talk to people. You got to pick up the phone. You got to find solutions. You got to think creatively. You got to just come up with something. Like you can't just go, oh, I asked ChatGPT and it didn't give me the right answer. Like you can't do that. <laughs> you yeah, got to yeah. just go after it and be be hungry. So I, I look for people that are that are hungry. I, I saw your LinkedIn post and I, I didn't love, love it. Then. <laughs> so, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, since you know you tapped on like kind of advice and then we want to know, you know, our audiences are aspiring product managers, marketers and content researchers. And do you have any advice to them to do their job better and to become a better marketer or to do the job better? Sorry, generic question. Oh, it can be a life advice as well. Yeah, life yeah, I, th advice. I think I'm thinking more, my, my mind is going sort of more life advice. Like, what's the best thing to do? It's like, you have to read. Like, I, I incessantly read and I'm really sad because I don't read any, um, I, I don't read fiction. I only read like marketing blogs. It's <laughs> all I read. Because I love it. I can't stop myself. I just read, I don't know, read four or five a day. And it just seems to be constantly like I'm just obsessed with it. So you have to read and dominate your field of knowledge, number one. And number two is, I think my second advice is network. You have to network with people. You have to get out of the building and meet people and say yes and go to an event and um, go up to people and get over your shadow and ring people up and send them a message and nurture your network because that is something technology can't replace. It is a source of knowledge, it's a source of work, it's a source of inspiration. You have to work on your network. Yes, that totally makes sense. And by the way, do you have any favorite books? You said, you know, you read a lot of marketing books. What's your best or best top five or, you know, books? I really like um, Traction. It's a little bit older uh, now. I forget the name of it. Uh, that was a really good book. Mm -hmm. um, but I follow more people. Um, so not necessarily uh, the second book, probably the best book on management ever. It's called High Output Management by Andy Grove, who was the <laughs> CEO of um, uh, Intel. Amazing. Um, and then I follow three people who I think have the best content on marketing and the internet. One is Emily Kramer, who is from Marketing One. The second one is Elena Verna. And the third is Carl Poya. And those three are just, just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, I will. Yeah, I will look into the recording again so, so that I can capture the name. Oh, you can send me an email. I'll write it down for you. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, but but I'm curious. So, sorry, so sorry to dig in, but you know, mm -hmm. what aspect do you think or makes you think oh they are legend or they are genius? Mm. Because they constantly add value. Like their content is easy to read. It's not. It's just genuine value add. I pay for those three. I, I pay the money every month because it's every time it seems to solve a problem that I have, there's frameworks in it I can reuse. I don't have to start everything from scratch. Uh, it talks relevantly. And it, like I feel that content keeps me really at the forefront of where the conversation is. So it's just an inspiration for me. I share it with the team. I use it to educate my um, the management or other people in the company. Um, so it's it's relevant and useful. Yeah. It's practical, practical in a natural practical. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for sharing. And so, and this is the last question. So we came through and, and so since Grasp is a platform where pe pe people share what they are reading, learning as a digital legacy, we want to ask you what legacy or impact do you want to leave behind or for future generations? Sure. Um, no, I, I love that question. Uh, so... The way I think about it, I think about what is the most, on the Maslow's pyramid of needs, what are the things that are right at the bottom that, that you know, if we build them up, and if we look after them, the rest um, can sort of flourish. And so number one is 
um, health. So I've um, the second is environment, education, and then in, in particular looking after women. And so what I hope to do in particular with the investment work is that um, if that's successful, that anything I don't need um, at the end of my life goes towards causes that support those uh, um, organizations that um, uh, look after the environment, women or healthcare company, healthcare organization. So I've, I've started with one company that I'm, one organization I'm extremely passionate about. They've just won the, they've won the Goldman Prize for the environment and the sort of Nobel Prize equivalent for the environment for protecting um, indigenous lands in the Ecuadorian rainforest. And with them, I've built a couple of schools where um, um, the old, let's say like the traditional knowledge gets preserved um and um yeah provides education support for local women and 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 children so that's something that sort of combines quite a lot of those uh, things i feel passionate about yeah it's really beautiful and and thank you for sharing all the you know insight and sharing your learning and knowledge with us today thank, thank you so much, much. I really enjoyed the conversation really really pleased to be on here great questions yeah thank you thank you